Um, and if you have your Humash, we'll, we'll be starting in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1. Hashem spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall observe a Sabbath rest for Hashem. For six years you may sow your field, and for six years you may prune your vineyard, and you may gather in its crop. But the seventh year shall be a complete rest for the land, a Sabbath for Hashem. Your field you shall not sow, and your vineyard you shall not prune. The aftergrowth of your harvest you shall not reap, and the grapes you had set aside for yourself you shall not pick. It shall be a year of rest for the land. The Sabbath produce of the land shall be yours to eat for you, for your slave, and for your maidservant, and for your laborer, and for your resident who dwell with you, and for your animal, and for the beast that is in your land shall all its crop be to eat. You shall count for yourself seven cycles of sabbatical years, seven years, seven times. The years of the seven cycles of sabbatical years shall be for you forty-nine years. You shall sound a broken blast on the shofar in the seventh month, on the tenth of the month. On the Day of Atonement you shall sound the shofar throughout your land. You shall sanctify the fiftieth year and proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be the jubilee year for you. You shall return each man to his ancestral heritage, and you shall return each man to his family. <clears throat> it shall be a jubilee year for you this fiftieth year. You shall not sow, you shall not harvest its aftergrowth, and you shall not pick what was set aside of it for yourself. For it is a jubilee year, it shall be holy to you. From the field you may eat its crop. In this jubilee year you shall return each man to his ancestral heritage. When you make a sale to your fellow, or make a purchase from the hand of your fellow, do not aggrieve one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee year, <clears throat> shall you buy from your fellow according to the number of crop years shall he sell to you. According to the greater number of years shall you increase its price, and according to the lesser number of years shall you decrease its price, for he is selling you the number of crops. Each of you shall not aggrieve his fellow, and you shall fear your God, for I am Hashem your God. You shall perform my decrees, and observe my ordinances, and perform them then you shall dwell securely in the land. I mean, <laughs> okay, that's the first Aliyah. Um, there's a few things that stand out uh, that I want to point to. Um, Shemitah is what the, the, um, the sabbatical year is called, right? Um, what does this mean, uh, the Shemitah? Uh, to withdraw from the field and let it rest as if it were not yours. So um, on the Shemitah, this is a reminder that the land belongs to Hashem. Um, this keeps balance between the rich and the poor in some ways. Uh, it reminds the, the rich man who is busy with his businesses and tending to his fields and all of his work to remember the poor man, and it, it uh, equalizes the poor man who doesn't have any uh, fields or a uh, great amount of wealth, that he is in some way equal to the rich man. Um, let's see. I have uh, some art scroll commentary that I'd like to share, um, and it gives three explanations of verse 1 uh, from the sages of Israel. Okay, Rashi cites Torah Kohanim's question. Uh, excuse me, let me back up. 
Uh, let me read the verse. Hashem spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of rest for Hashem. So Rashi cites Torah Kohanim's question, Why was the mitzvah of Shemitah singled out as being given on Mount Sinai? All the mitzvot were given on Mount Sinai. And he cites the answer, just as both the general rules and the individual details of Shemitah were given at Mount Sinai, so were both the general rules and the individual details of all the mitzvot given at Mount Sinai. In other words, explains Rashi, the verse is teaching us this rule to avoid a possible misunderstanding due to the Torah's structure. The final book of the Torah, Devarim, goes into the details of many of the Torah's commandments including many that are not recorded elsewhere. One might be inclined to think, explains Rashi, that those commandments were not given at Mount Sinai. Shemitah, on the other hand, does not have any of its laws recorded in Devarim, indicating that all its details were taught to the nation at Mount Sinai. By referencing Mount Sinai here, the Torah teaches us that all the commandments were just like Shemitah, and that their repetition in Sefer, Sefer Devarim does not indicate that there was no earlier detailed explanation at Mount Sinai. Um, or Hakaim quotes the Torah Kohanim, but is not satisfied with its explanation. So this will be explanation number two. Why, he asks, was the Shemitah specifically chosen to be the vehicle for teaching us this lesson? It would be more reasonable, he posits, that either the Torah's first mitzvah or its last should teach this lesson. So we would extrapolate that all the succeeding or preceding mitzvot were taught in their entirety at Mount Sinai. Also, he adds, there is another anomaly in the verse. The words, Asher ani notain lachem, that I give you, seem to be unnecessary. It is certainly Hashem who gives the land to His people. Why does the verse need to even mention that point? Or Hakaim answers that the verse means to underscore the relationship between Mount Sinai and the land Hashem gave to the Jews. It is only because the Jews accepted the Torah's commandments, all given at Mount Sinai, that Hashem gives them Eretz Yisrael. Although Or Hakaim seems satisfied with this explanation, uh, we'll go into a third explanation from Rabbi Shlomo Gansfri in his Sefer Aper Yon. So, uh, Rabbi Shlomo Gansfri is troubled by the Or Hakaim's conclusion. Why should it matter, he asked, that we merited the land of Israel because we accepted the mitzvot at Mount Sinai? However, the merit came about we are still equally obligated in all the laws of Shemitah simply because Hashem commanded them. Rabbi Gansfried explains that the Torah had a need to specify here, Asher ani notain lachem, that I give you, so that we should understand that the mitzvot discussed here, Shemitah and Yovel, apply only in the land given to us by Hashem. So uh, the Shemitah and the Yovel are indicative only to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, the seven-year sabbatical is not observed out in the exile. <clears throat> Yet if the Torah would not also have said Bahar Sinai on Mount Sinai, we could have thought that the only mitzvot that are obligatory are those that were dependent on the land, such as Shemitah, while others are not. Why so? As the Gemara explains in Tractate Shabbos 88a, since Hashem forced the Jews to accept the Torah by suspending the mountain over them, and you can see Gemara, Ibid, they, they had a valid excuse for sinning, as if to say that Hashem threatened uh, them by holding the mountain over their head to force them to take the commandments on. But We'll get further into it. Yet the Rishonim explained that when Hashem subsequently gave the land to His people, 
Their, accepts, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, their acceptance of it was conditional on their acceptance of the Torah's commandments. Um, and he gave them lands of nations so that they might safeguard his statutes and observe his teachings. From Tehillim 105, 44 through 45. Now that they accepted the land, they had no excuse for sinning. That is why the Torah alludes to the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai to indicate that the Jews were in their land solely because they had accepted the entire Torah upon themselves. Okay. All right, and I have some Musar here that uh, brings it round about. Uh, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein uh, from Darash Moshe Volumes 1 and 2 sees an important lesson applicable even today. In the Torah's emphasis that the mitzvah of Shemitah was given on Mount Sinai. As the Torah Kohanim explains, the words Bahar Sinai on Mount Sinai indicate that all the mitzvot of the Torah share a commonality with Shemitah. That commonality, says Rabbi Feinstein, is that the obligation to fulfill them is because they were commanded at Mount Sinai. Even the mitzvot that the Jews were commanded to perform before the Torah was given, such as Korban, Pesach, and Shabbat, are binding now only because they were repeated at Mount Sinai. Uh, with, I think a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, circumcision with uh, Abraham and the idea that uh, the Jewish people don't perform circumcision because of Abraham, but simply because it was brought down from Mount Sinai. Okay, furthermore, even the seven commandments incumbent on non-Jews are binding only because they were repeated by Hashem at Mount Sinai. So uh, that's interesting that the commandments for Jews and non-Jews were brought down from Mount Sinai. Uh, there's a uh, Ramez connection with that that I recently learned about. Um, the sages uh, have enumerated the, the Hebrew letters in the Ten Commandments and they add up to 620. Uh, so the, inf the inferment would, would seem to be, well, why aren't there 613 letters in the Ten Commandments? The connection is that you take the 613 commandments and add the Sheva Mitzvot and you have 620, which is encapsulated by the Ten Commandments. So what was the difference between Hashem's commands to Moshe regarding the Mitzvot incumbent on non-Jews and his earlier directives about the exact same behavior to Adam and Noah? Excuse me. It appears, says Rabbi Feinstein, that the earlier commands were that the seven mitzvot should be adhered to not because of Hashem's command, but because of the inherent sense in their fulfillment. One should not steal or murder because of the breakdown of social order. One should not eat from a live animal because of cruelty and so on. The result of this was that no lasting good resulted from all the students that Shem Aver and Abraham had taught. This was, <clears throat> this was because when one keeps a mitzvah because it makes sense to him, one tends to misunderstand the reasoning behind the mitzvah and to misjudge, especially when performing the mitzvah would be inconvenient. When it is or is not appropriate to keep the mitzvah's dictates, even if a person were taught the true reason for a mitzvah, he still thinks that his own understanding is more correct than that of his ancestors and teachers, and he will act accordingly. But when a person, Jew or non-Jew, fulfills the mitzvot solely because Hashem commanded at Mount Sinai that he do so, then he can perpetuate their performance properly. This is why this lesson is taught to us in the context of Shemitah, a mitzvah impossible to fulfill based on its reason. For even if one knows the reason for Shemitah, 
one cannot perform it unless he is doing so because Hashem said so. Otherwise, how will he last for an entire year without sowing or reaping? Even the produce that grows by itself has to be made freely available to all. Uh, that's to whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a wild animal, whether the animals are wild or domestic, the, the wild produce that grows from the land is for all. So nobody can go out and pick it and hoard it and count it and can it. And it has to be available for everybody. So, okay, I lost my place. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, let's see. So the only reason for performing the mitzvah is because he knows that Hashem commanded it and he can therefore rely on Hashem's promise that his sixth year's crops will be sufficient for his needs. And that's directly from Vayikra or Leviticus 25, 21 and 22. Furthermore, says Rabbi Feinstein, one must be very careful not to make up one's own rationales for mitzvot. This, this seems to be a p pretty popular thing going on today. Uh, and uh, I've seen it a lot, unfortunately, where people make their own rationales for observing mitzvot. And instead of learning from the, the sages, they, we have a tendency to take it upon ourselves to uh, do the mitzvot the way we see fit. And it's, it causes trouble. So even if he believes that by presenting them in this manner, he will be able to bring people closer to Hashem and the Torah, Entire groups of evildoers have resulted from people misinterpreting the Torah's reasoning. Uh, the Rambam uh, touches on that uh, pretty strongly in um, Mishnah Torah, the laws of the kings and their wars in chapter 10, um, Hilkot or laws number 9. Uh, he suggests that, uh, I'll just, I'll read the text, please, excuse me. An idolater who studies Torah is liable, liable to the death penalty. They should only be involved in the study of the seven mitzvot. Similarly, um, an idolater who rests even on a weekday, observing that day as a Sabbath, is liable to the death penalty. Needless to say, he is liable for that punishment if he creates a festival for himself. The general principle governing these matters is... They are not to be allowed to originate a new religion or create mitzvot for themselves based on their own decisions. Okay, so, but on the other hand, uh, in the next, the next law here that he lists, he says, we should not prevent a Ben Noach who desires to perform one of the Torah's mitzvot in order to receive reward from, do, reward from doing so, provided he performs it as required. So a person, uh, in other words, a person that has a tendency to be idolatrous uh, can easily take the, the reasoning of the Torah and twist it uh, to bring about evil ways where the person, uh, the non-Jewish person, who is uh, known as a Ben Noach, if, if he learns to, to do the appropriate mitzvot in the appropriate way from the teachers of Israel, then uh, he does something good. Okay. So that is another reason why the Torah saw fit to teach this lesson, that one must perform the mitzvot because Hashem has so commanded, specifically by means of the mitzvah of Shemitah. One can easily base one's understanding of the mitzvah on the fact that during Shemitah the wealthy and the poor are equal. No one owns the earth's produce. Thus one could suggest that the, the divine will is for everyone to be equal and that such sins as stealing be permitted in the name of social justice. Alternatively, one might think that the mitzvah of Shemitah demonstrates a divine concern for the environment and act accordingly. 
The Torah therefore teaches us that we must fulfill the mitzvah of Shemitah and any other mitzvah only because Hashem commanded us to do so and not for any other reason. Okay, um, and that's going to conclude our reading for today, and we're going to open up for questions and concerns.